Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Your word is the truth. This night we receive your word. We know it's being written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for bringing revelation knowledge to us. Father, we thank you that as we take hold of it, we do it, we put it in operation in our life, and because we're doers, we will see the fruit of it and we will see the victory. Father, we praise you for all that you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share with you on the subject of running the race and obtaining the prize. God wants us to run the race, obtain the prize of all the things that he has for us, and we're to enter into eternal life. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, the word says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. God wants us to know that you and I are going to run a race. It is a spiritual race in order to obtain all that God has for us. We talk about this word, obtain. This is a Greek word, kata lambano, and if you're here for the first time, in the lower window we put up information about words that are important at times. This is the Greek, this is the uh, Strong's number that's in the left corner, then the Greek word, and there's meanings and also other information that we bring up. This particular word means to be able to lay hold of. So you and I are to run this race, so we will be able to lay hold of the prize that he has for us. And we're talking about running this race. We see that this particular word, run, and this brings up the tense voice and mood, which is important, because verbs have tense voice and mood in the Greek, and they're very expressive and specific about what is being said. Notice that this is an imperative mood. That means this is a command. This is not a suggestion or a good idea. No, it's a command. God is commanding you and I to run this spiritual race. And also, this is not just something that is a short thing. It's an ongoing race that you're going to run throughout your life. It's in the present tense. The present tense in the Greek means ongoing, continuous action. So it's essentially saying that you're commanding us to continually be running this race, that you and I may be able to lay hold upon the prize that belongs unto us. Now it's also interesting, when we look at this word for laying hold upon us, it's not automatic unless you do what he says. The reason you know that is because this is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood is a mood that describes a statement that is made that is conditional. Conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, it's saying, again, run continuously that you may obtain this prize if you've met the conditions. There are conditions, and you'll be seeing them tonight, how we have to run in order to be able to obtain the prize that God has for us. We go on to verse 25. Every man that strives for the mastery, as you, are, you and I are running this race, we're going to be striving for the mastery. This particular Greek word is a Greek word, agonizomai, which means to contend with adversaries and also means to fight. You and I are going to contend with the adversary and we are going to fight. It's the same word that's used in 1 Timothy 6.12 where it says, fight the good fight of faith. You and I are going to fight this good fight of faith as we are battling the enemies and overcoming in order to obtain the prize, to lay hold upon the prize. Now, as you do this, it says you're to be temperate in all things. Temperance is one of the fruit of the Spirit, and this means to be self-controlled. Temperance is that fruit which keeps the flesh under control. Sin is dwelling in the flesh. You are not to walk in the flesh, you are to walk in the Spirit. As you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We cannot allow the flesh to rise up. Temperance is that spiritual force from the fruit of temperance that will keep us so the flesh will be kept in check. You are to walk in the Spirit, then you will not fulfill it. You are to crucify the flesh and mortify the deeds of the body, as the Word says. You are to be temperate, self-controlled in all things. Otherwise, we can't let the flesh rise up in any way. We're going to be self-controlled in every situation. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. 
you and I are going forth to obtain the incorruptible crown that God has for us. Then he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, otherwise I know where I'm running, I know what the spiritual race is all about, where I'm headed, and fight I, not as one that beats the air, what kind of a fight is it? It's a spiritual fight against spiritual enemies. When I speak against the enemies, I'm not just hitting the air and nothing's happening. Oh no, it's working. When you do what God's Word says, you have dominion, you can bind the spirits, you can loose their hold, you can cast them down, throw them down, root them out, you can cast them out, you can speak to mountains for them to be removed, you can conquer every work of the enemy, as you have dominion authority over all the power of the enemy. So you and I are going to fight this good fight of faith. And we are going to run, we know where we're headed, we are headed to possess the prize, this incorruptible crown that we're going to obtain. Verse 27, he goes on and he says, but I keep under my body. When it talks about keeping under, this is a word which is referring to the fact that you are going to keep this underfoot like you're buffeting it, like a boxer would buffet to keep this thing in line. You're going to make sure that your body does not get out of line. And you're going to bring it into subjection. Your body would like to run you. But no, we're not going to run by, be run by the flesh. We're going to walk in the spirit. When he says bring into subjection, this is a Greek word which means to make it a slave or lead it like a slave. But it's talking about you making your body your slave. My body's my slave. That's right. You're made of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. You're to be walking in the spirit. Your body's to be your slave. And your soul is to be, get, got, get renewed, get healed. Your mind gets, needs to get renewed. So you'll choose the way of the Spirit instead of allowing your body to run you. If we walk after the flesh, we're going to die, the Bible says. But if we, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, then we're going to live. Therefore, you need to keep your body under. And you need to make sure that you are making it your slave. Lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul is saying, just because I'm preaching the gospel, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be okay. I've got to walk this walk as well. I've got to keep this body under. I've got to make it my slave. Otherwise, I could be a castaway. The word castaway is the word adokimos, which means to be not approved. It's the word that's translated reprobate, talking about like a reprobate mind. Not approved. We will not be approved if we do not conquer the flesh. We cannot allow the flesh to get a hold of us and lead us and guide us. So we're going to run this race. It is a spiritual race. Now how are we going to do this? The scriptures show us the way that you and I are to run. We see in Psalms, Psalms 119, Psalms 119, we look at verse 32. He says this, I will run the way of thy commandments, when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Your heart's going to get enlarged with what? With the word that comes into it. Every time you hear the word, it gets written in your heart, and it gets written in your mind. So the, your, your heart is being enlarged through the word of God coming into it, and then what are you to do? You're to take hold of it and be a doer of it. So as you get the word in your heart, you're going to run the way of the commandments. You're going to follow the commandments. Now, what, are, what commandments are we talking about? We're talking about the New Testament commandments. You must remember that we're not under the Old Testament any longer. We're under the New Testament now. And there has been a change of law. Many people think that we're still under the Old Testament commandments. That is not so. Why would that be? Because there is a change of the law. We see it clearly said in Hebrews 7.12, where it's speaking of the change of priesthood that occurred from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Old Testament priesthood was the priesthood after the order of Aaron. The New Testament priesthood is the order of Melchizedek. Aaron was only a priest. In the Old Testament, you could be a priest or you could be a king, but you couldn't be both. Melchizedek order is a king and a priest. And that's exactly what you and I come into, because when we get born again, we are now kings and priests unto God. The priesthood has been changed. There's made of necessity a change also of the law. That means we're under a different law. Many people have thought, well, I'm in the New Testament. I'm not under law anymore. You are under law. It's the law of the New Testament, which is the law of liberty, the law of Christ, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, 
the law that will bring forth victory in your life. But nonetheless, it is spiritual law that you and I are to walk by. Therefore, we're to follow the commandments of the New Testament. So God wants you to run the way of the New Testament commandments as you hear and do the word. We see in Hebrews chapter 12, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice we have a race that we're running. This race that we're running, a spiritual race set before us, there's some things we have to do. we already seen we need to run according to the New Testament commandments. But also it says we're to lay aside every weight, everything that tries to pull you down, every burden, every weight. God does not want you burdened down or weighed down by anything. He wants you to follow the Word of God and walk uprightly before Him. Be obedient in all things. Don't let anything hold you back. And also He says the sin that does so easily beset you. Are there some sins that you haven't gotten victory over in your life yet? God wants you to get victory over every sin. Remember that you and I are dead to sin. We're alive unto God. Sin has no dominion over us any longer. Now, if we yield ourselves unto God in obedience to His Word, it will produce fruits of righteousness and bring forth holiness in our life and the end everlasting life. You and I can walk free. Sin is not to have dominion over you because now you have been, you're now dead to sin, but alive unto God. Now, as you run this race, it says with patience. The word patience is a Greek word, hupomone. Hupomone means, means a steadfastness or a constancy. You are going to run this race with steadfastness and constancy or also endurance. That shows a consistency of what you're doing. You're going to be consistent. You're not just going to be on and off. You're not going to be up and down. You're going to be walk, running this race consistently with steadfastness. And what does steadfastness have to do with? Steadfastness has to do with, this word hopomone has to do with the soulish realm. We know this from over in Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, down in verse 19, it says this, In your patience, same Greek word, hupomone, possess ye your souls. So where is patience going to work? In the soulish realm. Now remember, you are spirit, soul, and body. Temperance is keeping the body in check. Soul realm has got to be in ke kept in check as well, and this is through steadfastness upon the Word of God. Your soul is made up of your will, intellect, emotions, and as you get your mind renewed to the truth and you choose the way of the Lord, your patience being steadfast on the Word, you're going to possess the soulish realm, you're going to control it, you're going to make sure that it doesn't yield to the flesh, because it's got to yield to the Spirit and walk in the ways of the Spirit. Your Spirit, of course, has been changed, and so your Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, and you receive the Holy Spirit, of course, is right with God. But you've got to be steadfast in the area of the soul, because that also is the battleground with the enemy. The enemy tries to get to you in your mind, your will, or your emotions to get you to make wrong choices and yield to things contrary to God's Word. Well, we're not going to give place to that. We're going to run this race with steadfastness, this race that is set before us. And where is our eyes upon? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. This word here, looking, is significant that it's not just talking about, I just got my focus on such and such. It has more important meaning. It's this Greek word, aphorao, which means to turn the eyes away from other things and fix them on something. Otherwise, I'm going to get my eyes away from things that would lead me in a wrong path, and I'm going to fix them on Jesus. You're going to fix them on the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. So you're going to be fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher. The word finisher means the perfecter. He's the one who will perfect your faith. As you keep your eyes on Him and you do what He says, then you're going to be walking in faith. Who for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, that, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. The word weary here, we can't get wearied. God does not want us to get wearied. 
and it says faint here, and it's talking about, the King James translates this mind, but it's the word suke, which means soul. He's saying, you are not to get wearied and faint in the soulish realm, because remember, that's where the battleground is. That's why you've got to have patience, which is hupomone, steadfastness in the soul, so you don't let the enemy get you off track. God wants to make sure that we are steadfast in the soulish realm. And he says, but back the key you have to realize here, is how are you going to not get wearied and faint in the soulish realm? Because you're looking fixed eyes on Jesus, and you also, for the joy set before you, you're, you're looking at where you're headed. You've got a goal, you've got a vision, you've got something you're moving towards that you're going to possess. You keep your eyes fixed on that, even though there will be many adversaries, there will be pressure that comes against you, there will be temptations that come against you, there will be all kinds of things that will try to hinder you. Now, you're going to keep your eyes on where you are headed. He goes on and says, You've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You and I must strive. This word means to fight against sin. You're going to have to fight against it. Be ready to resist it. I've yet to see anybody resisting the sin to the point where drops of blood were coming off of them yet. God wants us to not be a pushover for sin. He wants us to resist steadfast in the faith that we're going to walk in the devil's attacks and his temptations that he tries to bring against us, and we're going to strive and fight against sin so we don't give place to it in our life. Over in Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. Philippians 2, verse 16, tells us something else. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Everything you're going to do, whether you're preaching the gospel to someone else, or you're confessing the word, or whatever you might be doing, it's going to involve the word. The word's going to bring life. You're going to hold forth the word of life. You're going to make sure that you are holding on to everything that God has for you, and you're not going to let it go. If so, you'd be running in vain. The labor would be in vain. He wants you to keep your eyes on the Word. Remember, you're fixed on Jesus, the Word of God. When you're preaching the Gospel, you're going to preach the Word to people. You're going to be giving them. You're encouraging people with the Word. And you're going to hold on to the Word, of course, in your life. We see over in Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 28, Isaiah 40, verse 28. He says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? He doesn't faint, and he doesn't get weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. He's your source in every situation, so you have strength and might to be able to conquer everything that would try to come against you. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But he says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We talk about waiting upon the Lord. This isn't waiting just doing nothing, or just waiting just wondering if he's going to do anything. No. This particular word here is a word which means to hope and expect. Expectancy. It's like the, he the Greek, Greek word el peace, or el piso, in the Greek, which is translated hope in the New Testament, which means the same thing, a confident expectancy. So, he, so those who have a confident expectancy upon the Lord, no, that means you've got to have hope. You have a confident expectancy. Things aren't just going to happen without you getting your faith in operation. Of course, hope, faith is the substance of things hoped for. You've got to have hope that comes from the Word of God. So you're going to have a confident expectancy in the Lord. Those that have that shall renew their strength. Because your eyes are upon the Word. What's going to produce it? The Word is going to produce it. The Word is going to strengthen you in you. They're going to mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. They shall not be weary. The key is, if your eyes are on the Word, that will always strengthen you to be able to keep running that race. You get blown away by the circumstances. You get your eyes on this or that. Then you begin to sink you begin to not be strong, you begin to get weary. That's what the devil will try to do. He always wants to get your attention off the Word through all temptations, whatever situation, circumstance you might be dealing with. No, you're going to run and not be weary. You're going to walk and you're not 
going to faint because you are going to rise up. And when it says mount up with wings as eagles, what do the eagles do? They rise above the storms. They don't fly into the storms. They don't fly around the storms. They rise above the storms. That's what you're going to do. You're going to rise above the attacks that the enemy would bring against you through the Word of God. And you're going to overcome and conquer everything that would come against you. Over in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4, we're running this race. We're going to obtain the prize. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 12. He says, When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. When thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. We don't have to stumble. The Bible says God will keep us from falling. Don't present us faultless. God wants us to know we don't have to fall at all. We can always overcome and conquer. Your steps are not to be straightened, be distressed. When you're running, you're not going to stumble at all. You're not going to fall. No, we're going to run this race, eyes on Jesus, doing what the Word says. We're not going to fall. Instead, we're going to overcome. Anytime you've fallen, obviously you've got your eyes off the Word of God, started doing other things instead of walking in the way of the Lord. God does not want us to fall. We're well able to overcome and conquer every enemy. We see over in Galatians. So you've got to get this mindset about you if you're going to run this race. You are able to go forth and to run this race and obtain the prize. It's a command, remember, that's been given to us. Galatians 5, verse 7. He said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? They were on course. They were running this race. No, they got off track. Who's the who? The devil is, would be working through whatever means possible to get you off track. In this case, what happened with the Galatians? The Galatians went back into the Old Testament law instead of following in the way of the Spirit. They made a big mistake. So, they hindered them. They quit obeying the truth. They went back into the ways of the flesh and walk in the Old Testament law, which brings you into bondage. No, we're going to walk in the New Testament law, which brings us into liberty and walk in victory in our life. Don't let anybody hinder you, anything hinder you, from obeying the truth. Obedience to the truth is so important because God, the proof of you is whether you're obedient in all things, as it says. God wants you to be obedient to all the things that He tells you to do, and you're going to walk in victory. Now, you must know that you are able to overcome every attack of the enemy. We see Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's talking about a person. Well, who would be doing that? The devil, working through whatever po way possible. Shall tribulation, which is pressure, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. These are all different means that the devil uses to try to stop you from experiencing and seeing and abiding in the love of Christ. He's trying to separate you from it. He goes on and says, As it's written, For thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Who views you as sheep for the slaughter? The devil does. The enemy. He wants, remember, the devil's your adversary. Walked the boughs at roaring lions, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour us. Well, we're not going to give place to him. We're going to, we can overcome him. We can resist him steadfast in the faith and walk in victory. But he loves to look at you as a sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You've got to know that you're more than a conqueror. You've got to know who you are in Christ. You've got to know that the greater one is inside of you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You've got to know that you've been given the weapons of warfare that are mighty through God that will destroy every work of the enemy and you can overcome in every situation. Jesus overcame and you can overcome. You, he's on the inside of you. He's given us everything we have need of. Every weapon, he's given us the word. He's given us authority and dominion. If we'll just follow him and do what he says, we will conquer the enemies in our life. But you are going to have to fight. As you're running this race, there will be adversaries that are going to come against you. And you're going to have to be ready to fight the fight. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Here it speaks of Timothy. He's speaking to Timothy. And he had some prophecies that went forth about him. 
Just because a prophecy went forth about you, does that mean it's automatically going to come to pass? No. He had to do something to make sure that those things came to pass, because the enemy will try to stop things from happening. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. You are going to war a good warfare, and you are going to conquer all of the enemies that are arrayed against you. Again, in 1 Timothy, down in chapter 6, verse 12, he says to him, Fight the good fight of faith. This is this word, agonizomai, that we saw before in 1 Corinthians 9. Fight the good fight of faith. And when he tells us to fight, again, this is not a suggestion. This is a command. You and I are to fight the good fight of faith. We are commanded to enter into the spiritual fight. I find too many Christians today that will not engage in the spiritual fight. They're looking for other ways to see things come to pass. It's not going to work. You've got an adversary who's against you. He wants you to engage in warfare. You are to fight the good fight of faith and conquer the enemies in your life, as well as to lay hold on eternal life and all of the promises of God. But you must engage in the warfare. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness, or these are hardships and things that will come against you, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You and I are soldiers in the army of the Lord, and he goes on and says, No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Otherwise, you can't get burdened down with the affairs of this life. Yes, we live in this world. We have to do things in order to, of course, we work and do all the things we do, just functioning in this life. At the same time, don't let yourself be burdened down with the affairs of this life that will hinder you from functioning in the things that God has for you. Remember, you're an ambassador for Christ. You have a call of God on your life. You're to carry out the will of God. You are to serve Him and carry out the ministry that He has for every single one of us. So we cannot allow ourselves to be entangled with the affairs of this life. That He may please Him who hath chosen Him to be a soldier. You and I have been chosen to be soldiers in the army of the Lord, and He wants us to conquer all enemies in our life. And we're also going to help others, of course, conquer enemies in their life. Now we go over to 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, we see it speaks about David in dealing with Goliath. David is the one who came because he knew he could get the victory over Goliath because he was an uncircumcised Philistine. And he'd already seen God, already, he'd already proved God, how he delivered him out of the, the paw of the lion and out of the bear. And so when the time came, when it was time to, for the, the face-off and the battle to come forth, what did David do? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48, it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He wasn't cowering away, he wasn't tentative, he wasn't just, uh, can I handle this or not? Or just waiting for him to attack him. No, he got on the offensive, didn't he? He got on the offensive. You've got to learn to get on the offensive. You are a king. You've been given authority. You have weapons. God wants you to get on the offensive and attack the enemy and take him out. He ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. He put his hand in the bag, took the stone, stone, slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone, stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. And of course, remember what he had said. He said the fact that he was going to come and smite him, and he talked about back here how he was going to come against him in the name of the Lord of hosts, and he was going to conquer him. You're going to do everything in the name of Jesus, and you're going to conquer the enemies that would be arrayed against you. So he ran after him, and he smote him. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. No sword in his hand, got the sword in his hand, ran and got it and took the sword and, of course, cut off his head therewith. God wants us to know that you need to get on the offensive against all of your enemies. If you aren't getting on the offensive, why not? We must, do we really know that we have authority? Do we really know we're more than a conqueror? Do we really know who we are in Christ and our weapons to have confidence? Do we really have faith in Him that He is going to bring forth His promises in our life? We need to get on the offensive and go after the enemies in our life. Now when we go after the enemies, 
There's not just going to be a few. There's going to be a lot of enemies that you are going to be dealing with. 2 Samuel 22, down here in verse 29. He says, Thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. For by thee have I run through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. He ran through a troop. There was a whole lot of enemies. You're going to run against all these enemies. And there's a lot of evil spirits that you need to triumph over. We can conquer them all, but we've got to get on in line with what he says, get on the offensive, get our weapons of warfare. Of course, you've got to put on the whole armor of God, which is through the Word in you. And then you're going to go forth, acting on the Word, putting the power of God in operation to see victory come forth in your life. We're going to run through the troop. Now, when you do this, you're going to be pursuing these enemies. David's Thanksgiving psalm was... 2 Samuel 22, 38, he says, I've pursued my enemies and destroyed them, and turn not again till I'd consume them. Now, that's someone who didn't stop. The word pursue means to run after with hostile intent in the Hebrew, from a negative standpoint when you're going after enemies. Destroyed them and turn not again till I consume them. That's someone who was consistent. This is someone who has stayed on the offense, attack against all the enemies to drive them out. I've consumed them and wounded them, and they could not arise. Yea, they're fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. For thou hast given me the necks of my enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. God's the one who does it, but how does he do it? You're involved in it. You're the one that is going to speak. You're the one that is going to wield that sword of the Spirit. You're the one that is going to release the power of God coming out of you. And you're going to speak in the name of Jesus that is going to see the victory come forth. But you've got to get on the offensive. We see that as he, when he got on the offensive, that was his testimony. But look what happened when this actually occurred that he's referring to. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 and following, it says, It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. And they'd taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. The enemy attacked and took some of their possessions. It says they took their women captives. All these, so they, they, now the enemy had been prevailing against them. So what'd they do? Of course, they were all upset about it. But verse 6, David was greatly distressed. Why? Not because of what happened. People assume that was what it was. No, it says, for the people spake of stoning him. That's why he was distressed. They wanted to blame him. Because of the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But what did David do? David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. If you have been under attack, if you have had some destructive things come at you, or if you do have a situation where something comes, don't get all distressed. Don't get all bent out of shape. Don't get in the flesh. Instead, get your eyes on the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord. God will fight the battle. The battle's the Lord's and the victory is ours. You need to encourage yourself. Encourage is taking courage in. E-N means in. What's the opposite? Discouragement, which is loss. This means loss of courage. Don't get discouraged, disappointed, depressed, down. Instead, take courage in. Get encouraged. Remember, how did they go to possess the promised land? He said you, you commanded them to be strong and have a good courage. That's what it takes. You're going to have to be strong and courageous. And so David encouraged himself in the Lord as God. Not in his own ability, but in the Lord. Remember, you can't overcome anything in your own self. You're going to overcome everything by the Lord because he is going to give you the victory as you do what he says. So he comes and he inquires in the, at the Lord in verse 8. He says, shall I pursue run after with hostile intent after this troop. Shall I overtake them? He answered, and God said, pursue. God will tell you, go after your enemies, run after them, start to drive them out, start to defeat them in every area, wherever they're affecting you. Thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Well, notice, he wasn't just sitting there waiting around. He had to get on the offensive and went after him to overtake them. And he said that he would recover all without fail. And that's exactly what happened. So they began to go after him. And 
as they were going after him. He pursued here, but there were some that were so faint they couldn't go all the way. They couldn't get, get in this battle. That tells you something. If you are going to be able to fight the battle, you do have to have spiritual strength. You're not going to be doing it in the flesh. You're going to be doing it with spiritual strength. These guys were too faint. That's why you've got to get strong in the Lord now so that you'll be able to run the spiritual race and to conquer your enemies and get on the offensive. You need spiritual strength. Well, as they went after him, we come down to verse 17, when they caught up with them, David smote them from the twilight even to the evening of the next day. There escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. David recovered all that the Malachites had carried away, and he rescued his two wives. There was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they'd taken to them. David recovered all. If he could recover all, you and I can recover all. What has the enemy stolen from you? Has he stolen your health? You can recover your health. You have dominion, you can cast out all these spirits, and you can take hold of healing power and, and bring forth the, your, a restoration of your health, because God is one who is the heals us. We have a covenant. I am the Lord that healeth thee. He'll heal you of all your diseases. He is the healer. He will set you free. Has he stolen from you in other ways? Has he affected you mentally or emotionally? Or you've had all kinds of problems going on from hurts, wounds, damage, emotions. You can cast all those spirits out and receive his healing because he'll come to heal your soul and bring restoration as you meet all the conditions and do what he says. He will bring forth victory for you. You can recover everything. He recovered all. You can recover all. Otherwise, don't, don't submit yourself and succumb yourself and just accept defeat. No, we are going to go forth and we're going to recover all that the enemy has taken from us. He will prosper you, he will bless you, he will heal you, he will deliver you, he will bring you out of bondage, he will accomplish the things that he purposes for you in your life. We see another thing over in Proverbs. Proverbs in chapter 18, verse 10. As we're running this race, he says, verse 10, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. You want to understand that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, a place of fortification, a place where you're going to be protected, and you can speak in the name of the Lord. Be ready always to speak in the name of Jesus. That will bring him on the scene to deal with enemies' attacks against you. Everything that we do, we're to do in the name of Jesus. That's the name that releases the authority that's delegated to you. You speak in the name of Jesus. You cast out in the name of Jesus. You pray in the name of Jesus. You, everything you do is going to be in the name of Jesus to release the authority given unto you. Another thing that's going to be important if you're running this race is you do need to be a worshiper of the Lord. God wants you to become a worshiper of Him. And don't think that you can't worship him when you have all these things coming against you. This is the man from Gadara who had the legion of demons in him. In Mark chapter 5, verse 6, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. If this guy who was so bound, cutting himself out in the tombs, running around with no clothes, just absolutely out of his mind, can run and worship him, you and I can certainly run to Jesus and worship him. He did that in the state he was in, and Jesus began to cast the demons out of him and saw him be set free. God wants you to run to the Lord and begin to worship him. You don't worship him after you're free. You worship him all the time, even in the, when you have the problems that you're dealing with. He saw Jesus. He's the answer. I'm going to run and worship him. And that's what you want. You want to be a worshiper of God, a praiser and a worshiper. Enter into praising and worshiping Him continually. And that is so important. We see another scripture. If you're going to see God bring forth what He purposes, we do have to walk right. That's for sure. In Proverbs 21, verse 21, if we walk in sin and think we're going to overcome, it's not going to happen. Proverbs 21, verse 21, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. Whatever you're following after is what you're going to get. You follow after it, you're going to be able to obtain it. And this word follow after is, again, this word for pursue, 
Same word translated pursue, which means to run after. So you're going to run after this. We're just going to knock, we're not talking about just ambling along. We're talking about running after righteousness. God wants you to run after righteousness and mercy, and then you're going to find life and righteousness and honor. We see over in Isaiah chapter 51. These are all conditions that are important for us in running this race. Isaiah 51, verse 1. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after or run after righteousness. Ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence you're digged. So what does God want us to do? He wants us to hearken to him. He wants us, of course, to pursue righteousness as we are seeking after the Lord. Therefore, we're going to have to put the Word of God first place because how do we pursue righteousness? It's the Word of righteousness, that we do the Word. We walk in the ways of obedience to the Word. In fact, it's interesting what it says over in Proverbs chapter 15, down here in verse 9, talking about the one who pursues righteousness. It says, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that is running after, following, running after righteousness. Same Hebrew word. Otherwise, if you run after righteousness, God loves you. He doesn't love those that walk after the ways of unrighteousness. He loves them in the sense that he'll call them to repentance, but he's not going to manifest himself to them. He loves those that love him. And if you love him, you're going to follow after righteousness. You're going to do his commands and obey him. He loves him that follows after righteousness. That's why God wants you to run after righteousness. In fact, if you'll run after righteousness and do the things that he says, God will bring good things off after you in your life. Psalms 23, where it talks about the Lord is my shepherd. You and I are a sheep. He's the shepherd. We're following him. Sheep follow him closely. And it talks about all these different things. And we come down to verse 6. And he says, if you've met the conditions of him being the shepherd and you're the sheep, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me, run after me, this is the word again, pursue after me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's goodness, His mercy will run after you. God will bring it forth in your life. If you do the things and you make Him truly your shepherd, and you allow Him to accomplish all the things that He wants to in your life. And of course, He wants you to look unto Him. You look unto Him, you're not going to lack. He'll make you lie down in green pastures, prosperity. He'll lead you beside the still waters. He'll bring peace to you. He restores your soul to bring healing, deliverance, and restoration to the soulless realm. He's always going to lead you in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. You're never going to walk contrary to righteousness and think that you're going to be right with the Lord. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death because you're in this world and it's all around, I'm not going to fear any evil. You cannot have any fear of the devil or it's going to stop the blessings from coming your way. Thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod is Jesus, the Word. The staff is the Holy Spirit. They comfort me. We have the Word and we have the Holy Spirit that are comforting us as they're ministering to us. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That tells you the enemies are all around, but God's table of blessing will be there for us as you and I walk in His ways. Anoint us my head with oil, the anointing upon us. My cup runneth over, and then surely goodness and mercy will run after me all the days of my life. If we meet the conditions and, and look to Him as our total source, He will bring these things to pass in our life. Surely, absolutely. Now, we need to, at the same time, make sure that, again, we're meeting all these conditions that the Word talks about what you and I are to run after. 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, Follow after, and this is now a Greek word, dioko, which means, again, to run swiftly after, or to run after something. You and I are going to run after charity. This is the word agape, which means love. We're to run after love. Everything we do must be done in love. You know, it doesn't matter what, you have faith to remove mountains, you, have, you, know, you don't have love, profit you nothing. You know, you're nothing without love. He's given us a command that every one of us are to love one another as he's loved us. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. It is mandatory that you walk in love 
seeing everybody as valuable, precious, and of great importance, and you always do what God wants you to do, showing forth love, including your enemies. Remember, we love our enemies. It doesn't matter what people do. We always give them what they have need of, not what they deserve. Otherwise, you make yourself a judge. We see also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to run after everything he says to run after. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow, dioko, run, that, run after that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. You treat everybody the same way. You're going to run after these things. Everything that's good. We're not going to do any evil things whatsoever. And we're going to run after things that are going to produce peace. Don't let yourself get in strife. Don't let yourself get in contentious situations. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after, same word, dioko, the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. God wants you to be a peacemaker. Remember, blessed are the peacemaker? And he wants you to be an edifier. You know, you're supposed to be edifying. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but the only that ministers grace to the hearers brings edification. He wants you to be a builder-upper. You're to be building people up. Well, what if they don't deserve it? That's not your position. You're not the judge. You go give people what they have need of, not what they deserve. That is important. In fact, if you want to solve all relationship problems, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, if you'll do this, your relation problems are done in your life because you're going to do the word. Matthew 5, 44, I say unto you, love your enemies. Doesn't matter how they treat you, you're going to love them anyway. Bless those that curse you. Well, why would I bless somebody that curses me? They deserve evil. God's the one who will repay. He avenges his mind. He's the one who will judge. You and I cannot be a judge. You and I instead are supposed to give people what they have need of. They need blessing. You bless them instead of responding back negatively against them. Do good to those that hate you. Well, I'm not going to do anything for them. That's a mistake. You do good to those that hate you. You represent Jesus and do everything that he wants you to do. So it doesn't matter what people do. It's not dependent upon what they do. You, Because if you act like them, you're in the same boat they are. And he's just like, you've done it too. You've got to do what God wants you to do. Remember, however you give out to others is how it's going to come back unto you. So you're going to be good, good to them that hate you, and you're going to pray for those that spitefully use you and persecute you, not just write them off and say, forget them. No, you're going to pray for them. You learn to give out to people what they have need of. Your problems are going to be over because you're not going to respond out of the flesh or what they did to me. Any of the me, 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 I, 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 that's all flesh. It's all coming out of pride. It's all coming out of things, out of hurts, wounds, what they did, what they said. They didn't do all this. You're in the flesh every time you do that. We've got to come out of that. No, we're going to walk in the Spirit and do the things that God wants us to do in every situation. We're going to follow the right things. First Timothy, remember God's the judge. Well, well, they, I didn't see any bad things happening to them. Don't, don't worry, they aren't going to get away with it. Nobody gets away with anything. God's the just judge. Everybody is going to stand before him. He, judgments are going to come before on every person. He may not have come yet, but their day will come. You're supposed to delight in mercy, not in judgment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. Although thou man of God, flee these things. Anything that's not it's unrighteous and wrong is what he's been talking about before, is the love of money, things that pierced him through with many sorrows. Flee, get away from all these things. And follow after, dioko, run after. Righteousness, godliness, anything that's godly, by being a doer of the word. Faith, love, patience, steadfastness, meekness, these are things that we're supposed to follow after, run after. He wants you to be running after these things. And then he came back and said it again to him in the next letter, second letter to Timothy. He's bringing it up to him again, 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee youthful lusts. Follow, run after dioko, righteousness, faith, charity, which is love, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You just want to be right with the Lord all the time. Don't be moved by what people do. 
you walk as God wants you to walk and release all the things that he says for you to run after. Hebrews chapter 12. It also tells us something else. See, we're going to possess this prize, remember. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Follow peace with all men. Again, Tioko, run after peace. Don't let yourself get outside of peace. Don't get into strife. Don't get in contention. Don't get in arguments. Don't let that happen. And holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. <laughs> we got to be holy or we're not going to see. We're not going to see the Lord. God has commanded us to be holy as He is holy, to become holy. So we're going to walk and seek after holiness at all times in our life. Everything that is holy before Him. 1 Peter 3, we see it again down here in verse 11. Let him eschew, which means to turn aside from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue, which means dioko again, to run after it. You're going to seek it and you're going to run after it. Always do what he says to run after the things that God wants to see these things come to pass. I guarantee you, if you're running after something, you're really wanting to see it. You're not sitting there, you know, well, maybe if it happens, it happens. No, you're making sure it happens because you're running after it, doing what the Word says so it happens. Otherwise, you're proactive. You're not, you know, you're not in limbo. You're not, you're not just sitting around doing nothing, letting whatever happens. No, you're going you're gonna to do what God's Word says, and you're going to see these things come to pass. This is what the Lord wants you to do. You're going to run this race. Now, if you don't walk in the ways of the Word, well, what's going to happen? Well, the enemy, he's watching you, and he's going to come against you. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and follow. Or Hosea chapter 8, verse 1. I mean, Hosea 8, 1 he says, Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord. Why? Because they transgress my covenant. You've got to understand you're in covenant relationship. You've got your responsibilities and God's got His responsibilities. If we don't carry out the word that He tells us to do, we break covenant. We're transgressing the covenant. And trespassed against my law by not doing what the word says. Israel, which is a type of the church, shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. They couldn't believe. Why is this coming against me? Well, here's the reason. Israel has cast off the thing that's good. What they cast off? They cast off the Word. They decided they were going to do what they wanted. They're going to handle it in the flesh and handle it my own way. You can't get anywhere handling it your own way. You're always going to make a mess of things and everything's going to always be given place to the enemy. And what happens if you cast off that which is good? The enemy shall pursue and run after you. He's coming after you because you're not walking in the way of the Word. In reality, you're either going after him and conquering him and seeing him put underfoot and walking in the way of the word, or if you're not, he's coming after you. We're not sitting on, no, nobody's sitting on the fence. You're either getting rid of him or he is going to be coming after you if you cast off the word and do not do it. The enemy shall pursue him. We can't allow the enemy to get hold of us. We've got to be ready to deal with him. In fact, we even see the enemy he, he understands about being active and being aggressive and being in the, on the uh, all-out attack against you. Exodus chapter 15, verse 9, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will run after him with hostile intent. I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust will be satisfied. I'll straw my sword, my hand will destroy them. He gets on the attack, on the offensive. He's going after you. That's why you've got to be ready to conquer him. But you're going to have to have spiritual strength. Without spiritual strength, you aren't going to be able to stand. Too many Christians get blown away by the attacks of the enemy because they don't have the spiritual strength to stand. Look what it says. Nahum 3, verse 11. Thou shalt also thou shalt be drunken, thou shalt, thou shalt be hid, thou also shalt seek strength, because of the enemy. You need strength so you can stand against the enemy. Without spiritual strength, you're not going to be able to conquer him in your life. He expects you to get spiritual strength and go out and be able to conquer the enemy. In fact, that's where the enemy, see, he knows. We even see a case. Remember, David had smote Goliath and, and had conquered enemies. Well, this was the plan that here. Ahithophel, who was the 
uh, serving Absalom here. Absalom, remember, there because of the things that happened with David, it was, he had trouble in his house from then on, wars in his house. And so he says, speaks to Absalom, he says, let me now choose out uh, 12,000 men. I'll arise and pursue. I'll go after David this night. And look what his plan is. I'll come upon him when he's weary and weak-handed, and I'll make him afraid, and all the people that are with him shall flee, and I'll smite the king only. What's he looking for? He wants to get you weary. He wants you to get you weak. He wants you to get you in fear. What does the devil want to do? He wants to get you weak. He wants to get you when you are not afraid. He wants to get you when you're weary of things. You cannot allow yourself to get weary. We are not going to be weary. We're going to stay strong. We're going to walk in strength. We're going to abide in strength. And we're not going to get weak. We're not going to get in fear. Fear is a door opener for the enemy. You are going to walk by faith and not give place. And so he was all out to try to get to him. It shows you the enemy has a plan and he will try to bring destruction against you. But what should you do? You got to turn it around and get on the enemy and destroy him instead. We see over in Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26, we pick up over in verse 7. God says to him, you shall chase your enemies. This word again is this word radaf in the Hebrew, which means to run after with hostile intent. You're going to run after with hostile intent against your enemies. They shall fall before you by the sword. What is the sword? The sword of the Spirit in the New Testament. And what is that? The rhema in Ephesians chapter 6. Rhema means that which is spoken. Otherwise, your sword is in hand is when your mouth is working, speaking the word. So you are going to smite your enemies by speaking forth, releasing authority and power as you're speaking the word or speaking in line with the word. He says five of you will chase a hundred. Same word, run after. A hundred of you will put 10,000 to flight. That's a lot of enemies to deal with. That's right, there's a lot of enemies out there in the realm of the spirit that you're going to deal with. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. And then he goes on and he makes quite a statement. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. That's what God wants. But he had to chase his enemies to see this happen. And notice the first thing he says, I'll have respect unto you. Which implies, if you don't run after your enemies, I won't have respect unto you. He said, you shall run after these enemies and get on the offensive and conquer them. And then he says, what's going to happen is you conquer them. I'm going to make you fruitful. And I'm going to multiply you. And then I'm going to establish my covenant with you. See, we want to see the establishment of the covenant and all the promises come into pass. But it's not going to be just because uh, you decide you want to just possess all this without dealing with the enemies in your life. You have to conquer the enemies in your life. Then you're going to bring forth fruit as you're walking in line with the Word. He's going to multiply you and establish His covenant because that's what He wants for you in your life. And that's what He will bring forth. In fact, it is a little by little process of systematically destroying your enemies, whether it's casting out the demons or whether it's in warfare intercession, which we continually work against to drive these things out of the heavenlies. Most Christians don't understand that. It's an ongoing battle to drive everything out of the heavenlies as well as to cast it out of you. Exodus 23, verse 30. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee. It is a little by little process of systematically driving out the enemies wherever you're dealing with them. Until thou be increased. The word increased is the word para, which means to bear fruit. Until you bear fruit. Remember what he said when they chased their enemies? I'll respect to you. I'll make you fruitful. And then he would multiply them. And then he would establish his covenant. And what's that? That's the inheriting of the land, possessing the promises of God in our life. That's, gain, gain, that's part of the prize that you and I are to go after. We're to go and to possess all the things that God has for us. And we are going to get on the offensive and go after all these enemies. This means you and I must get into the warfare mode, and we must get into the spiritual fight, and we must take it to the enemies. Luke chapter 16 Verse 16. Luke 16, verse 16. He says, The law and the prophets were until John. John, of course, is preaching about the gospel coming. 
Since that time, when the kingdom of God was preached, he says, every man presseth into it. What came with Jesus? He brought the kingdom of God into manifestation, the rule and the reign of God, which you and I have been delivered out of the authority of darkness. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You and I are in the position in ruling and reigning, but you've got to operate in ruling and reigning to enter into it. So every man presses into it. It's interesting. The word presseth is a Greek word, biadzo. This means to use force and inflict violence on. You are going to use spiritual force and violence against the enemy. There is no mercy for the devil. It is all-out attack, destroy everything that he is doing in the realm of the spirit to see God bring forth the rule and the reign of God into manifestation in your life. A scripture that we ought to look in conjunction with this that shows this from the types, as far as the New Testament application where you see Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 15. Look what it says. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. What do judgments come on us for? Because of sin, whether it's from inherited generational, or our own sins, or victimized in life. So we have these judgments. How does the Lord take away our judgments? He casts out the enemy. We cast out the devils. We drive them out. What happens when he does that? The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. That's the rule and the reign of God coming into manifestation in your life to destroy the enemies and get rid of them in your life. What's going to be the result of that? Thou shalt not see evil any more. Wow, well, that is a tremendous promise. We'll take all that, won't we? Not see evil any more. That's not a promise when you get to heaven. It's a promise now. A promise for you and for me. And you can see this point here. See here, he's, he's casting out the enemy. The king with kingdom is manifest. We see this being shown when Jesus was casting out the demon over in Matthew chapter 12. Look at the statement he made. Very similar as far as the application. If I cast out devils, he's casting out the enemy by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Otherwise, God's rule and reign comes into your life when you take dominion and destroy the enemies in your life. They're going to be eliminated. And what happens when the king comes in the midst of you? You shall not have any evil anymore. God wants you to come to the place of walking in victory in your life. And we're going to rise up and we're going to do the things that he says. And we're going to conquer every enemy in our life. You must know that he has promised to give you victory. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. He says this, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not just a statement of fact, just to be an encouragement to you. It's actually telling you what the Lord does for you in order to do this. That He's doing this experientially when you're acting on His Word. The reason is because the word giveth is in the present tense in the Greek. The present tense. Literally the way you translate this, thanks be to God who is giving us. Is giving us. This is Young's literal translation, the finest New Testament translation that I know that translates things accurately, tremendously, in many, many cases throughout the New Testament. Is giving, showing the ongoing work, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As you and I are warring the good warfare fighting the good fight of faith, taking hold of the promises, pursuing our enemies and driving them out, putting our authority in operation to destroy the works of the enemy. And this isn't just something that God will do once in a while. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Thanks be unto God which always, that's not win a few and lose a few, always causes us to triumph in Christ. Always causes us to triumph. That is what God will do for us if we do what he says. Present tense, continuous repeated action. There isn't any win a few and lose a few. It's win them all when you're doing what God says. He is our victory, and he will bring forth victory for you in your life. We must do what he says. Now, when you're in the fight and you got your faith in operation, you cannot let the devil get to you and get you to cast away your confidence. 
Hebrews 10.35, cast not away your confidence. Do not ever cast it away. And what's your confidence come from? The promise of God, the word of God that you see is the truth, which is your hope, your confident expectancy of what God will do. It has great recompense of reward. Hey, it'll, the reward will come, which is God performing his word and bringing forth the promises in your life. He goes on and says, for you have need of patience. Aha, uh -huh. steadfastness. Because where's the attack? Coming against your mind. Trying to stop you from continuing to keep your faith in application. Keep on pursuing and destroying the enemies. Keep on speaking the word. Keep on praying until you see the manifestation of the promise. You have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive. This is a word komidzo, which means to carry off the promise. You might see it come into manifestation. Don't cast away your confidence ever from the word of God. God's word is the truth. If you're not seeing something happen, it's either you don't have knowledge of what you need to do yet, or some reason the enemy is able to work against you, or you haven't done the things you need to do, or you haven't conquered all the enemies yet to see the victory. There's a reason why. Don't ever think that God's holding anything back. He withholds no good thing from those that walk uprightly. He wants you to have victory in your life. He wants you to overcome. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be delivered. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants to be blessed. He wants you to be fruitful in your ministry and everything that you do. He wants you to function in it. But you're going to have to be steadfast in the midst of the attacks that come against you. At the same time also, you need long-suffering. Many people, they just don't stick it out. God wants you to be long-suffering in the face of circumstances that haven't changed yet. Hebrews 6.12, Be not slothful, but followers of them, who through faith and patience. Now, this word patience is not a hupomone, as you will see. I put the cursor over it. Look below. It's a Greek word, macrothumia. It's not a good translation. It's not correct. Macrothumia means long-suffering. We can show you just from the usage of it. There's a tremendous program. There's 14 times the macrothumia is used in the New Testament. Twelve times it is translated long-suffering. Two times patience, this being one of them, erroneously. It should be translated long-suffering. Through faith and long-suffering, inherit, and the word inherit shows the process of you possessing, as you're walking it out, possessing the promises in your life, because this is a present tense verb. This is why Young's translates it uh, here, uh, are inheriting, showing the process of inheriting the promises. So you need faith in operation. You need steadfastness in the soul. You need long-suffering in the face of the circumstances that haven't changed yet, knowing that your faith will bring the victory. But you've got to keep your faith in operation. You've got to stay on the offense, destroying the enemy. You've got to be fighting the good fight of faith and laying hold upon the eternal life and taking hold of everything that God has for you. All the promises of God, of course, you've got to be sure that you've dealt with all sins in your life. You must certainly have repented and turned away. You cannot be walking in the flesh or the ways of the world or walking in sin and think you're going to get anywhere. No, you're going to have to be righteous and holy before the Lord as you walk the way of the Lord. Be obedient to Him, doing what He commands us to do. One last passage of Scripture. It's over in Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. You and I, remember, we're running this race to possess the prize, to gain the incorruptible crown, to gain the victory that God has for already purchased for us, but see it manifest in your life as He works to perform His Word, as you do the Word, to bring forth everything that he wants, these prom these get promised you in your life. We see in Philippians 3, verse 8, Paul, he realized, he said, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. I could care less about all that. I want to get the real deal, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. That's what they were doing in the law to Old, Old Testament, which would never produce righteousness. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ, because you have to get a brand new spirit. You have to be born again. And that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. God wants you to understand you are to know him. He wants to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with you through the word of God and through the working of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And the power of his resurrection, the power, dunamis, the power of God is what you live by, which will be manifest when you do what the word says. Because the power of God is resident in his word. When you speak and do and walk in his word, the power of God goes into operation to produce fruit, promises, victory, overcome the enemies in your life. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Yeah, you're going to have the sufferings. Uh, remember, the disciple's not above the Lord. You are going to have the sufferings because the enemies will attack and try to stop you. When the word comes into you, Satan comes immediately to try to take the word out of your heart. You've got to be ready. You've got to be doing what he says. Even if you rejoice in the word, you like it, but if you don't have any root established in you, you know, affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, and he endures but for a time, and then he stands away in time of temptation or gets offended because you have not become to the place of being rooted, which is a here and a doer and becoming spiritually strong in your life. That's why being a here and a doer of the word now, every day, is important so you're going to be able to deal with what comes at you down the line. If you think you're going to suddenly get super strong in a moment when the attack comes, you're kidding yourself. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen because you have done the work of hearing and doing and building your spiritual house and you've got the strength of God in you because you've been walking it out consistently. And you will have the attack of the sufferings, but God delivers you out of all. The, Paul said, I've had all these afflictions and persecutions, but God delivered me, delivered me out of all of them. He'll deliver you out of them all. Being made conformable unto his death. And he says, if by any means I might attain, this means to arrive at, the resurrection of the dead. Where are we headed for? Eternal life and being resurrected, getting our glorified body. Remember, it's the whole deal's not done yet. We got a new spirit, praise God, but we don't have a new body yet. The resurrection of the dead is the culmination of this work of redemption. When we are going to see that happen, we're going to get a glorified body, praise God. He says, I might arrive at the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I'd already attained. Not as though I've already taken hold of this, Lombano. Either we're already perfect. He hadn't come to perfection yet. You and I haven't come to perfection, but we're on our way. Hopefully you are. Doing what the Word says. Working out your own salvation. But I follow after, Dioko. I am running after this thing. I guarantee you, if you've just been laying around, just whatever happens, happens, waiting for the, you know, Jesus to come back or something, you're not on target at all. You need to get running this race. You and I have been commanded to run this race, remember? Run to obtain. We're going to run after, if that I may, catalambano, which means to lay hold of that for which I am lay hold of, of Christ Jesus. He purchased you and laid hold of you. Now you need to go and lay hold of all that he has brought, made available for you so you enter into it and possess it in your life. Brethren, I count not myself to have arrived, this work, or laid hold of it, Catalambano. I haven't laid hold of it yet, but this one thing I do, I'm forgetting the things that are behind. Don't let things that have happened in the past hold you back from following and running and following after the Lord and running after Him. Don't let anything, I don't, you may have had some terrible, devastating things in your life. Forgive. Confess the sin. Let it go. Don't get your eyes on it. Today's a new day the first day of the rest of your life. What are we going to do? Let's get on target. Let's go. Let's run this race. He says, I'm, I'm forgetting the things that lie behind. I'm reaching forth to the things that are before. That's right. We're going forth. He says, I press. It's the same word, dioko. I am running after, towards the mark. This means the goal. For the prize. And what's the prize? The prize is the award to the victor of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You and I have been called to liberty. You and I have been called to the kingdom. You and I have been called to obtain the glory of God. You and I have been called to enter into everything that he has for us and obtain victory. So we're going to run towards the goal for the award for the victor of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we're going to possess it as we do what he says. And who's going to do the work? God's going to do the work. You can't do it yourself. 
You're going to do his word that puts him into operation to perform the word in your life. You can do nothing of yourself. Jesus did nothing of himself. He said, I can do nothing of myself. He did everything the Father told him to do. As the Father in him was even doing the works. Wasn't Jesus doing it? He says, the Father that dwells in me is doing the works and accomplishing everything. Through the word of God, he's going to accomplish everything in your life and you're going to see victory. I told you that was the last one, but one other one we want to look at. Revelation 21, verse 7. He that overcometh, nakao, conquer and carry off the victory is what this means. The one who conquers and carries off the victory. And this isn't, but, oh, I got a couple victories in my life. No. Present tense. Continually conquers and carries off the victory. That's what God will do for you. I mean, you got to get your mind renewed and Aha, uh -huh, he'll do this for me. That's right. I'm going to get with the run, get with, get with the show, get with the program, and start running after all the things he says and watch him do it in my life. He that conquers and carries off the victory shall inherit all things. We want a full inheritance. We want a full reward. We want to inherit everything that God has for us. If we will conquer and carry off the victory, we will. We'll see everything come to pass. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. We want to accomplish everything. If you and I will do what he says and run the race, we will obtain the prize of the corruptible, incorruptible crown, eternal life, resurrection of the dead, glorified body, inheriting all things, conquering, carrying off the victory. Of course, in the life to come, Maybe you'll be getting authority over 10 cities because you have done the things that he told you to do in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This life's a vapor. Don't get your eyes on what's going on in the negatives. Get your eyes on the Lord. Get your eyes on what he wants you to do. Don't be moved by what people have done or haven't done or what or this situation or that. The devil will work all kinds of circumstances against you. Get you tossed every which way. Get your eyes on the big picture. And don't let yourself have anything to do with the things of this walking in the ways of the world, get contaminated by sin or works of the flesh. No, we're not going to let it happen. We're going to run the race and obtain the prize. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God. I'm commanded to run the race and obtain the prize. I will be obedient. I'm making the adjustment. This night... I'm going to run the ra after the race that God has for me, and I'm going to see everything come into manifestation. I will conquer every enemy. I will take hold of every promise. I will obtain the prize. I will obtain everything that you have for me. Thank you, Lord. As I'm obedient to all that's been declared in your word, I will see you accomplish this, and I will obtain the prize. Thank you for performing your word and bringing this to pass in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. He will do it for you. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for all you brought forth. I thank you. We got ears to hear. I thank you that we're not going to be slothful. We're not going to be lazy. We're not going to just be going along at our own pace. We're going to get on track and do what you say. And I thank you. There'll be much fruit as we do your word. And we will obtain all that you have for us. Thank you for much fruit as we hear and do this word this night. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.